The Rock of Brawl is set in the Spelljammer universe, but this module can be run in just about any campaign. Written in 1992 by L. Richard Baker III, this is a floating pirate city. The Rock was discovered by the Captain Brawl, a notorious pirate in need of a secure hideout. Ignoring the rumors of the haunted space in the area, he selected the rock as an ideal lair. Air and water were plentiful, and he seeded the topside and underside with trees and crops. The caverns that form the modern docking caverns were his first home. A charismatic leader and a brilliant tactician, Captain Brawl soon assembled a small fleet, and he named them the Black Brotherhood. A town grew up around the port as more people and races came to settle and build. Many were rogues and thieves, but some were merchants and entrepreneurs. The Rock was a lawless town in endless revelry and unchecked dueling. Brawl himself came to a bad end, leading a raid of five ships against the groundling city. Although the raid went well, the elven fleet was waiting for him in orbit. Eight man of war attacked, and only one ship escaped. Captain Brawl perished in his viper ship, the Starwind, as it fell in a glorious blaze to the world he had just raided. For almost 60 years after Brawl's death, the rock remained largely unchanged in character. The city grew slowly, climbing up the top side of from the old pirate layers. No one tried to impose the order on the town, and most people were content to live that way. The pirate captains ruled the city by popular consensus. Then there was a pirate named Kazar, a clever and ambitious man who sensed that times were changing on the rock. He evicted all the pirates and bought up most of the land around them. Anybody who didn't go with him was forced out or bought out. After Kozar's rule was Franz, his son, and he wasn't the man his father was. He loved to build things and made the city a lot bigger and grander, but spent the coffers. During Franz's rule, the Niyogi first surfaced in the rock's sphere. The Niyogi trader who put in and demanded to see the prince was kept waiting for more than a week. It was finally insulted and driven off the rock by Franz's order. Since Fran found the creature too arrogant for its own good, the Niyogi returned six months later with a small fleet of kinsmen in an, the abandoned dwarven citadel, bent on demolishing the rock. The citadel was dropped on the rock, leveling a part of the middle city, but it did not wreck the city as it hoped. The Niyogi left in disgust, and from promptly seized and on the demolished quarter as a perfect site for the festival grounds. So this is a great way to introduce the Neogi race into the plot if you want to as a DM. After Frum died, his eldest son was Prince Kalar, a decadent man who took after his father, spoiled and pampered his entire life. Most people assumed that under his rule, the royal house of Khazar would eventually pass into insignificance. This was, however, tragically erroneous. Six days after taking the throne, Kalar was found in the jettisoned rubbish trailing the low city. Prince Andrew, Frum's second son, stepped up and assumed the throne. He was a man cut from a different bolt of cloth than his father and brother, and a quiet leader who seized the reins of power within hours of Kalar's death. Kalar's wife protested, claiming that her young son, Eric, should inherit his th father's throne, but Andrew, firmly entrenched in power, altered the rules of succession. So here's a great way to introduce um, political intrigue and undermining of plot with a son possibly killing another son to regain the throne. All mysteries, all up for the dungeon master to interpret what they want. So Brawl has about 12,000 people. There's a fragile balance of oxygen, that is consumed by the population with the oxygen produced by the vegetation of the noble villas and the underside fields. Um, water is plentiful on Brawl due to its large, huge lake. Uh, it's called Lake Brawl, and it's abnormally clean and cold. The water is drawn from the lake by a large gravity driven by pumps located on the gravity plane. Public water service has been installed in most of the high city and middle city, but the large areas of the low city must get their own water uh, from a few central piped wells. So as you can imagine in a pirate rock, the average lawbreaker has to really go out of his way to be taken into custody. Most of the people here believe that policing themselves. So tavern keepers will have a couple of stout people around to break up fights or market vendors, you know, trust their own eyes and spot uh, the shoplifters. So this is a great place for your thieving um, 
bandits or whatnot, you, your mind, your imagination can go wild here. There is one exception to that rule, and that's in arson. Um, if you are found with the, um, committing arson, you will be jettisoned off the rock. There's also some hard labor that is fined. So if you do get caught and are found guilty, you will be asked to do some labor on the underside of the rock where there is fields um, for the food that is done by people that are um, in jail. If you're looking for a protagonist, the underbarons are a way to go. They are the criminal lords of each city. Each uh, sitting underbaron is at the center of a web of theft, extortion, gambling, drinking, and any of the other illicit activities. They have fences and financers and neighborhood patrons. They are just more than a thief guild. They own a lot of merchant trading and they fighters and informants and they even have government officials in uh, many areas of the city. Their word is law. So they run things pretty tight where they're located at. Other than humans, there's other races that live on the rock. The elves are spacefaring and are cold and distant. They recognize Andrew as a manipulative double dealer, um, but they still have respect for him. The doors have a, a pretty good population as well. They don't have a unified front like the elves, but they're in constant contact with all the other citadels. And when you speak for one, you speak for them all. So Prince Andrew understands this and has always kept a good relationship with the dwarves. My favorite is the Mind Flayers. Uh, the Illithid are frighteningly polite to the people of the Rock. In general, Andrew enjoys about the best human to Mind Flayer relations anywhere. Uh, most Brawlians agree that this uh, is because even the Mind Flayers need a neutral ground on which to conduct dialogues with other races, and Brawl is that place that they do it. So this is a great place for a Dungeon Master to develop plots with the mind flares and the illithid uh, and bring a face-to-face -face contact with them instead of always being in the shadow uh, another race is the neogi like before we talked about how the neogi attacked um, the rock and so they have a very heated relationship with prince andrew in fact if any come by he's waiting for them to be blown out of the sky so this is also a great protagonist to always have in the background of plots with the Neogi and their massive amount of wealth and money and also um, revenge for what they feel has been slighted. So let's get into some of the NPCs here. Let's start with Prince Andrew. He's a tall, slender, graceful man, 44 years old. Um, studied some magic and soon took up the study of statecraft and intrigue. He doesn't really have time for a lot of people and doesn't have patience. So anybody who and any player character walking up to him is going to have a hard time unless they have something pressing of matters. The way that they wrote this module, it seemed like they wanted it to be an obstacle for player characters to actually get to see the, the prince. Moving on to Lady Serena, she's a beautiful dark-haired woman of 28 and has schemed her way to Andrew's side. Quiet and reserved, she is never far from him. Andrew is capable of loving few besides himself, but he cares for Serena. She is primarily interested in maintaining her position as a consort and carefully plays Andrew's moods. Next is Lord Darden Cartan. He is Andrew's most capable and least trusted of the henchmen. He's witty, elegant, roguish, with a heart as black as the night. He is an iron fist inside Andrew's velvet glove. He's a schemer and an arranger and carries out the prince's darkest orders. Uh, he is descended from um, Brawlian nobility, but spent many of his years off rock, pursuing a prosperous career in property redistribution. Next up is Maxara Kahl. Maxara is captain of the Royal Guard. She arrived in Brawl some eight years ago from a far groundling realm on a privateer. A skilled fighter, she joined the Royal Guard and worked her way up through the ranks. A tall, athletic woman of barbaric appearance, she bears serpent tattoos on her arms and sports a shaven head and only a queue of dark hair. There is Eric Kozar. He is the son of Kalar, the nephew of Prince Andrew. Eric has grown into a strong young man 
who, like his uncle, resembles Kozar far more than he does Fraun or Kalar. Eric does not have his uncle's ter- temperament, however, and prefers to spend his time studying and vo- voyaging uh, to other spheres. He plans to unveil Andrew's role in his father's death someday and to restore the legitimate line of succession to the throne, but that time has not yet come. Uh, he's a marked man who has every move is closely watched by Andrew. Eric has survived several assassination attempts. He rarely receives visitors and goes abroad in the city uh, because of the threat of attacks. So this is a great chance to introduce him into your plot if you want to um, help facilitate some type of adventure for your PCs. There are a ton more noble families and merchants that are within this module that I just don't have the time to go over, but they're there if you need them. There's another power called the Council of Captains. These are companies or houses that own land or five or more ships that also have a lot of sway in the council and um, how government works. One of these Council of the Captains is Valkin. He's an extraordinary individual who has led a long and colorful career. He's a burly man in his early 40s with a stern face, salt and pepper hair. He's fallen paladin who took to wild space after a tragic love affair. He never speaks of his past. Valken does not own five ships, he, but he does own and operate the largest and most successful merc- mercenary group on the rock. Valken's legions, he chooses his causes and has never sided with an evil power. His men are utterly loyal to him, and he only selects the finest and most disciplined warriors to join his ranks. He is one of the few who takes his council's duties seriously, and this is a great NPC to introduce to develop quests for your players if they want to go the mercenary route. Another one of these Council of Captains is Vaskar Irenifens. He's a tall, bony man. Vaskar is the senior agent of the Chain Men. Uh, since slavery is frowned upon on Brawl, Vaskar has been ordered to present himself as an independent merchant, trafficking in silks and spices. House Efferens is just a facade. Um, and hidden beneath the mask of ordinary trade, Vaskar supervises and sells and transports and slaves from secret pens in the Underdark of Baral. Vaskar is a man of endless suspicions and few, if any, real friends. This is a great protagonist to have if you want to develop um, somebody who is working maybe with the Neogi or the Mind Flayers to, to have conflict with your player characters. One of my favorite characters in this module is Dargaz. He's an arcane. He is leading the representations of the arcane on the Rock of Brawl. While most cities are only briefly visited by the traders in Wild Space, the arcane maintain a permanent presence on Brawl. The individual arcane charged with this duty appears to rotate at intervals of about three to six years. Dargaz is a typical arcane, aloof, concerned only with trade, as a courtesy with his people. He is invited to sit as a member of the Council of Captains. Um, Dargaz is always accompanied by a bodyguard of five to ten seasoned fighters and is known for displaying an especially distrustful and arrogant attitude towards everybody. The Arcane are a very strange race, and to introduce them to your player characters um, with a bunch of ideas that you can come up with is very interesting, and I find it very Um, intriguing on all the different plots that you can come up with. Another NPC that is very interesting is Estrandria. Uh, He is the head of the Alithid Embassy at the Rock of Brawl. This duty is considered extremely distasteful from other mind flayers through wild space. Um, And he has become on, have disfavor within the Elder Brains. Um, He appears as a typical Alithid, but wears robes of the finest qualities with exotic trappings, Most of the Mind Flayer's time is spent in contemplating the end of his servitude in Brawl. He rarely emerges from his embassy. The various Mind Flayer nations that employ him do not feel the need to communicate with other races, but a half dozen Mind Flayers of the lower rank also work in his embassy, and there are between 80 to 90 of them included in the population of Brawl. This is a great way of bringing conversations with the mind flayer and with your player characters and have more of a dialogue with 
your player characters through uh, with a mind flare, and it creates a very interesting dynamic. These next two are very interesting creatures. One, you have a Dracon, which is the dinosaur looking creature. Uh, Stakalia is old and powerful, and he is the voice of all the Dracons in space. He is very formal and deliberate creature, cautious and crafty. Like the Illithid, the Dracons do not often have reason for discourse with other races, unlike Estandria. This does not leave Stakalia with nothing to do. On the contrary, he is the Kaaba of all the Dracons on Brawl. This is a herd of about 150 broken into about 20 family groups. While Stakalia rarely speaks for all the Dracons, he often speaks for the Dracon Enclave in Brawl. And next up, you have Serga Tomajak. He, General Tomajak is a hero of legendary proportions to most of the GIF. He is a leader to be followed and admired. He is rather poor diplomat, but the considerable GIF community follows his orders without hesitation. Tomajak supervises an organization and employment of various GIF platoons that are always being formed in GIF Town. He also represents the GIF Barrio in Andrew's court, which occasionally creates comic scenes. Tomajak will storm up to the palace, prepared to threaten Andrew's life, disarm him by offering the GIF uh, relative meaningless concessions. The Tomajak will march back to the GIF town, believing he got the better half of the prince again. Sarjak Tomajak is known for the Gauntlet of Tamos. He wears an exploding glove that he uses uh, in fashion and combat. Um, this is two very interesting races that are, you know, very not very utilized much in D&D. And you can play them on here and make some interesting scenarios for your player characters. Brawl's principal fame stems from its role as a free port and as a crossroads in the glittering realms of wild space. It is only natural that many of the great companies of the spheres would have chosen Brawl for, as a base of operations. So let's go over a couple of these. You have the Long Fangs. They are one of the most notorious mercenary organizations of Wild Space. The Wild Fangs are a brotherhood of chaotic and evil warriors. You have a trading company, staunchly neutral mercenary organization, which provides both soldiers and weapons for various conflicts. You have the Smith Coast Coasters. Uh, they are one of the largest, most successful companies in Wild Space and owns and operates a fleet of a dozen tradesmen. You also have Gaspar's Reclamation. It's a small company of elite treasure seekers. If your player characters want to go on treasure hunting, this is the company that they probably want to join. You have the Sindith Line. The Sindith Line is specialized in operation of a passenger liners. Um, so they kind of bring people to and from. So maybe this is the company that they first come into the rock on. Then you have like a protagonist, uh, the Chain Men, who are the human slavers. Um, they are banned from Brawl, however, um, we already went through in the house of uh, Aaron Fetz. Uh, they are masquerade as silk and spice traders, so that's a great way of introducing those people. You also have the Arcane. The Rock of Brawl is one of the few places where the Arcane seem to maintain a permanent presence. At least one of the Arcane is on the rock at any given time through a rare occasions. As many as five or six may cross paths in the Brawl, which is amazing since they are so um, unique in Wild Space. They usually lease a warehouse and a uh, fine store site, but some of the arcane have been known to prefer living in, at one of the city's better inns. The arcane supply rare and valuable spelljammer equipment. In general, they meet with prospective buyers and agree on a price and then take an order anywhere from a day to a month or maybe may pass, and then the buyer will be advised when this purchase has arrived at the warehouse. The arcane warehouse is extremely well guarded, but on one occasion, a skilled burglar broke in and only find it entirely empty. The thief mysteriously vanished, but not before he had a chance to tell his tale to a few, enhancing this legend. Then you also have a the Dwarven Boarding Company. They're one of the finest mercenary groups in all of Wild Space, and uh, the fabled Dwarven uh, Boarding Company uh, is a group of warriors for hire who specialize in naval combat. You have Valken's Legion. Valken's Legion is simply the best mercenary company to hire in Wild Space. 
They are led by Valken Rogan. We went already already went over this, so this is a great company to be hired to you know be fighting in wild space. You have House Kolik. It's a wealthy merchant house. You have House Zudrek, House Daxalt. Just tons of this module is full of information that you can scour over and just pick and choose what you need. Rising above the crowded mayhem of the rest of Brawl, the high city is a green, spacious area of marbled palaces and noble villas. To most Brawlians, it is a realm beyond their own, a place where the average citizen may set foot only a dozen times in a lifetime. There are few actual restrictions that make this so. It would appear that the separation of the elite and the masses is a natural development. At the highest point topside is Andrew's Palace. It crowns the rock. Enclosed behind white walls, the seat of the ruling prince is a rambling building of elegant domes and climbing vines. Few indeed are the commoners whose business takes them inside to see the prince. You have one of the most finest restaurants in Inn on Brawl is the Man of War. It affords a spectacular view of Lake Brawl. The dining room enforces a strict dress code. Arms and armor are definitely forbidden. A typical dinner runs between 8 and 12 gold pieces per person. Service is excellent, and the food is the best on the rock. You have the Noble Council. It's a majestic building. It's one of the principal landmarks in the city. It rises above an open floor that seats about 200 people. The Great Dome, with its pointed steeple, is one of the first things a spacefarer will see um, and pick out as they approach the rock. Although the Noble Council has not met in three years, Prince Andrew does address the citizens of the city from the podium on a rare occasions when he actually speaks indirectly to the people. The chambers surrounding the council dome are used as the offices for the bureau and land distribution and management. The library spheres, the headquarters of the seekers in this crystal sphere, as well as impressive collection of books, tomes, scrolls, manuscripts, all descriptions are in the library spheres. The city of Brawl is too young to have accumulated a library of this size, but the seekers were forced to move two of their smaller collections to Brawl about 30 years ago. These two collections account for the majority of books that can be found in the library. The library is open to any patron and never closes. To a patron of the library, one only needs to pay one gold piece a year. Limited checkout privileges are granted to patrons, usually three books at a time and no longer than a month. Honored patrons don't donate about 50 gold to get this privilege. Let's move on to the middle city, encompassing the crowded market streets and quiet neighborhoods of well-kept townhouses. The middle city is an area whose borders are defined differently by each of the Brallian. Most people agree that the old wall separating the high city is a good trailing edge boundary for the middle city. But on a leading edge, no one can say where exactly the low city stops and the middle city begins. The financial and merchantile sec center of Brawl, the mid middle city, is also home to thousands of Brawlians who can afford to move away from the low city, but do not belong to the elite high city. It is more of a quiet and orderly than the low city. Street brawls are relatively rare here, and taverns are more expensive but somewhat safer, and the shopkeepers and craftsmen are more honest. Despite this, the middle city still is brawl, and anything can happen. Here's where you'll find the Elven Forest. Perhaps the most beautiful place on all of the rock is the Elven District, commonly called the Forest. As the Elven Center of Brawl, the Forest is a mystical grove of birch, laurel, ash, and oak trees. Many of the trees are several hundred years old, which seems to contradict the known history of the rock. There is a strange silvery shadow beneath the eaves of the wood that seems to wall off the elven district as surely as a fence of iron. Few elves actually live in the forest. Several dozen adventurous and merchantile uh, types maintain fine townhouses in the city, but no visitors to the forest have ever seen a dwelling inside the silver wood. You have the Arena of Frun, an impressive stadium of the same white granite used as the palace. The arena seats 500 people comfortably. The facility is rarely used, but once a year set of races jumping contests and mock gladiator combats take place here. 
You have the Raised Cup, one of the many taverns and small inns in the Middle City. The Raised Cup is a battered old hole that belongs in the dirty surrounds of the docking edge. Although humble in appearance, the Raised Cup caters to a special group of patrons, the Pragmatic Order of Thought. The Order long used the Raised Cup as their secret safe house and meeting place. The Raised Cup offers excellent food and drink at good prices, belying its ramshackled exterior. You have The Edge. One of the largest and busiest taverns of Brawl is The Edge, an establishment catering to starfarers. It is considered fashionable for the elite to gather here, as The Edge is known for its dangerous and colorful clientele. Some rogues, conmen, and professional duelists earn their living from this wealthy crowd. The proprietor maintains a quiet force of six talented bouncers. Elmander Starchart. The half-elf mage Elmander is Brawl's most famous astronomer. He retired from adventuring some years ago, took up surveying and charting as a career. Gaspar's Reclamation, a shop stocking magical items and other rare and unusual treasures. Gaspar's Reclamation occupies a fine position at the intersection of Grand Street and the Great Market. The Great Market, a chaotic area of small vendors, open-air street performers, beggars, orators, merchants, and buyers of all descriptions. The Great Market is perhaps the most vital and exciting place in the city of Brawl. No other place carries the same broad-shouldered love of life and gold, nor conveys the rock's mercantile spirit in quite the same way. The Great Market attracts the curious and the greedy of dozens of spheres, and it's said that anything can be bought or sold at the Great Market of Brawl. Gamelon's Curios, one of the most famous small merchants of Brawl, is the archmage Gamelon Ediger, a famed traveler and scholar. He collects and sells unusual magical items, favoring any item that assists the space traveler or spell jammer. Gamelon is unusual in that the arcane often deal with him and have taught him some of their spell jamming Dwemer craft. His home, with his broad courtyard and several buildings, is behind the shop. He is noble by virtue of land ownership since he purchased the grounds of his home with the crown some years ago. Gamelon generally does not welcome visitors into his home, but he does enjoy a story or two in the company of some good adventurers. The White Galleon. This quiet inn in Tavern is located off the major streets between the Armada Street and the Man of War Street. The exterior is rather nondescript, but inside you will find a roomy, comfortable hostelry with fine service and good rates. The White Galleon is especially noteworthy because it houses Dargaz, the Arcane. The Arcane has rented the top suite of rooms for six months now, and shows no sign of moving soon. Dargaz has hired a small squad of very capable bodyguards and several clerks and mass messengers. The entire upper floor of the White Galleon has been absorbed by his operation. The tavern owner, a halfling named Bardilic, is quite happy with the situation. Dargaz pays him a small consideration, and considering that the Arcane attracts a lot of merchants and adventurers, who come in, they usually buy a round of two, so keep him a little extra coin in his pocket. The Council of Captains. Another of Frum's architectural achievements, the Council of Captains contains a large hexagonal council chamber and two grand wings. The wings contain the offices of the Bureau of Customs and Bureau of Trade. The Council of Captains meets once a month, and most members prefer to send their votes via proxy. The offices of the Secretary of Council of Captains are here as well. The Secretary herself, Bianca Macharl, is often found in her office. She is the head of both bureaus and under counsel. She has recently attracted a lot of attention by arming her customs agents and instituting a crackdown on smuggling. The Low City, the vital beating heart of the rock, is in the worn of the streets and crowded markets of the maze known as the Low City. Alive with activity at all hours, the Low City never sleeps, and the entire communities breathe and grow by the Byzantine squares and alleyways pressing against each other in an endless struggle for light and space. The streets are choked into with shouting, pushing peddlers, beggars, and thieves. You can turn a corner and find yourself in the middle of someone's home, standing amid the huts and lean-tos of the wretched, leaseless brawl. Or you can stumble onto the battlefield of rival guilds and gangs where dozens of rogues brawl for the rights of few more alleyways or tenements. The low city may be dirtier and poorer than most of the rest of the rock, but is the most people it captures the rugged soul of the city. It is a crowded waterfront of wild space, a melting pot of incredible diversity. It may be one of the few places in the world where one's race or creed makes no difference at all. There is no room there is there is room for everyone in the low city. The Dwarven District, one of the city's largest and most well defined barrios. The Dwarven District is actually one of the more prosperous areas of the low city. 
The dwarves are, on a whole, a skilled and hard-working race, and their presence on the rock dates back to the first pirate havens. While the dwarves are by nature a taciturn and clannish folk, living in such close proximity to other races has made the Bralian natives far more tolerant of outsiders than the groundling kingsmen. The Elithid Embassy Actually comprising a complex of several buildings with covered walkways and boarded windows, the Elithid Embassy is a quiet, brooding building which radiates menace. Very few Bralians ever find reason to set foot here and are quite happy to keep it that way. Several dozen mind flayers live in the low city and their relationship with the official embassy is unclear. They seem to be living independently of their native lands, but the ambassador, Ishrandra, appears to command their respect and obedience. In any event, very few beings of any race cross the Elithids and live to tell the tale. Rumors persist of a large cavern or underground facility beneath the Mind Flayers complex, where human slaves are kept as cattle for the Mind Flayers' unspeakable appetites. Gift Town The gift do not come close to filling this block of the low city, but they are easily the dominant race of this neighborhood, and certainly its most remarkable feature. The gift have but one occupation, soldiering. Every household features a sign proclaiming the availability of its occupants of military duty, and few gift remain between jobs for very long. The rest of the houses and stores of this barrio belong to the armorers, smiths, and weaponeers who make a living keeping the gift in business. The head of the gift com community is a short-tempered General Sarig Tomajak, and it is widely supposed that he could mobilize all 300 gift of Brow into a single army. The Rock Rat perhaps one of the four or five dirtiest and most dangerous taverns in Brawl. The Rock Rat is a ramshackle old building decorated with a battered old nautical gear, catering to the cheapest sailors and tradesmen calling it that Brawl. The Rock Rat also enjoys a fair amount of local flavor. It is a favorite among the GIF. The Rock Rat Bouncer is a famous ogre named Grinder, who is actually a rather decent fellow for an ogre. No one is allowed in with weapons, but the bare-knuckle brawls that occur from time to time are sufficiently dangerous even without arms. The tavern's bad reputation and questionable clientele has led to its general boycott of decent and honest folk. The Holy Keep of Bane The rock is not without its fair share of cults and hidden temples. The Holy Keep of Bane is one of the lesser shrines. The Holy Keep of Bane is housed in a run-down, decrepit building, with the followers only a few dozen evil mages and warriors, the Rampant Lion is one of the better taverns and inns in Low City. It is hidden in one of the alleyways surrounding the Lesser Market. Although the Rampant Lion is clean and cheap, it is avoided by native Bralians. Guests in the inn have an unnerving a tendency to disappear, never to be seen again. The owner, a portly human hostler named Warris, claims that the vanished guests have merely shipped out again in the early hours. Some people claim that the site of the Rampant Lion is above a secret slave pit, where drunken sailors are sold to mind flayers as cattle. Of course, these wild rumors are substantiated. The Arcane Warehouse, perhaps a single most mysterious structure on Brow. This was an abandoned warehouse until 11 years ago when the Arcane decided to establish a permanent presence in Brow. Working through the middlemen and agents, the Arcane purchased the building from the Crown for an exorbitant sum and proceeded to completely remodel it. An elite force of skilled and loyal mercenary group guard the building, posting sentries on every wall and on the roof. But even they never have been inside. However, the arcane make major helms and receive them from the smuggled cargo, because this is where the purchasers are taken when the new helm is carried out. There is some speculation that a gate or an extra-dimensional doorway is hidden inside the warehouse, and they have their arcane homelands lie beyond. No one knows for sure. A reference warehouse. This isolated warehouse is full of silk, cotton, and spices. However, the careful observer might note that the inventory never changes. This is because the real trade of house efference is in slaves, who are kept in secret pens beneath the warehouse and beneath the house offices in the city. Ships flying the reference flag sail out to meet chainmen slavers and transfer slaves and goods in some hidden location. They then repaint the ship and bring it back to port, making it appear that it is a different from the ship which just left. 
Dracon Town. The smallest and newest of the barrios, Dracon Town consists of only 20 or so extended families of, in the area immediately surrounding the Dracon Enclave. The Dracons do not live anywhere else in the city since their affinity for their own kind will not allow them to live anywhere but in the company of their own race. The Laughing Beholder. A small but prosperous tavern, the Laughing Beholder is owned by none other than a large Luigi, a famous beholder and a tavern keeper. Luigi is an extremely wise and knowledgeable beholder who is one of the very few members of his race to understand the beholder destiny, to learn and to teach. Luigi is a civic-minded and well-liked citizen of Brawl and spends most of his time listening to the rumors and far spheres and great adventurers. Very few people realize that Luigi's knowledge is godlike in its scope, that he is vision of the potential of the beholder race. He has at one time known everything there is to know about anything in the entire multiverse. Chances are good that he realizes that all of existence is contained within the imaginations of the weird class of beings beyond gods who call themselves role players. Luigi is more than happy to share information with anyone who cares to seek the answers from him. But he is an infuriating tendency to withhold vital knowledge. He cannot reveal knowledge that would upset the balance of the cosmos, and on many occasions that would depend on something as simple as an adventurer knowing where to find a fabled ruin or a reclusive hermit. All he asks in return is a story of song for many patrons. A laughing beholder is rarely troubled by bullies or hoodlums. Large Luigi's powerful magical abilities quickly put an end to trouble virtually before it starts. This is by far the most iconic place in all of the Rock of Brawl. And it's very interesting and setting that if you're venturing here, this is one of the places that is, always comes up. I've only touched half of what is in this module. This is a great resource with whatever your imagination wants to come up with they have it here so scour through it pick and choose what you want to bring your adventurers to because there are plenty of things here well i hope you enjoyed my breakdown of the rock and brawl i can't wait to run it for my group tell me what you're doing with your groups in the comment section and like and subscribe thank you everybody